Praise the Lord. We've been talking about unity, uh, church, for the last uh, eight weeks or so, so um, at least in this series, we took a couple weeks off, and we've really been just in chapter one. Well, today we're going to hit chapter two. Praise the Lord. We finally made it to chapter two, but we're still talking about the beginning of unity, what it means, what, 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 where's the starting port of unity, where does unity flow from? And one of the things we talked about was what it means to be in Christ and really that active, growing, meaningful relationship in Christ, being in him, being the vine or the branch that's plugged into the vine and remains plugged into the vine. Because uh, we know it talks a lot about that in in Paul's writings. He talks a lot about being in Christ. Um, Then we got into the benefits of being in Christ and we went through five weeks of that. And then last week, we got into Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, and just as a little recap of that, um, he continually, he said, I continually offer up prayers of thanksgiving to God, is basically what he said, for their strong faith, for your strong faith and for your love for one another. He thanked God for that. He just, he said, continually, I thank God for that. He also then prayed that they would receive spiritual wisdom and insight so they could grow in their knowledge of God. So in essence, he was kind of saying, I I thank God because you get it, but I'm going to really tell you now that you need to keep getting it, and I'm going to pray that you keep getting it and and keep getting it, because how many know that you can get it once, and you can kind of walk away from it and relax it a little bit, right? Anybody ever experienced that? You get it, and then you're like, oh, yeah, that's great. That was great for a while, and now I'm kind of relaxed again. And we do that. We let the world creep in, and it begins to kind kind of dilute the truth that we, that we landed on just maybe weeks previous or, or just a short time before. We don't want those truths to be deleted in our life. And so he kept, he kept praying for them. And, and then he, he, he said this, he, he wanted them to understand and he prayed that they would understand the power that is within every believer. And we talked about that word believe a little bit, that it's more than just a mental assent kind of belief. It's such a strong belief that it results in commitment. This was all last week's message. Um, And it's the same power that lives in us that rose Jesus from the dead. And and what an amazing thing to just contemplate. How the same power that rocked the grave lives inside of us, and, and that power helps us to live our Christian life in victory. Victory over sin, victory over struggles and circumstances. And it also is the power uh, that, that helps miraculous works be displayed in our life as we minister to others. Um, Miracles and, and signs and wonders follow those that believe. And so we talked about that just a, uh, real quickly last week. But today, this morning, we're going to talk, we're going to go to the next section, which is um, Paul's reminder, so to speak. His reminder. Um, and yeah, is that up there? Yep, reminder. His reminder. Remember where you came from. And I, I think there's something very healthy about looking back and seeing how far God has brought you. I remember what I used to be like. I remember the things he brought me through. And it's not always easy to go back and think about those things, especially when they were painful and when you may have not fully recovered or processed those things. It's so easy just to say, ah, it's over, it's done with, it's in the past, you know, akuna matata, right? <laughs> it's in the past, it doesn't matter. Jesus got me through it. I don't have to remember it anymore. And, and I think there's, there's something about that that's kind of like, let me, let me refer to it as the Christian two-step. Step back from the problem and then quickly sweep it under the rug. Or maybe it's quickly claim the blood of Jesus over the issue and call it finished. And hear me, church, I know the blood of Jesus has the power to cover our shame and guilt from anything in our past. And when we understand what the power of the blood of Jesus can do, yes, those things don't have to hold us back. I get all that. But there are those situations that need to be processed a bit more methodically so that we can find some emotional healing and clarity regarding those difficult things we go through. And then actually live in a place of victory over them. I venture to say... And, and I've been doing this a while, this pastoring thing, and I've counseled a few people. But it's, it's very interesting how you can bring up something from someone's past and their instant tears. And they're not tears of joy, they're tears of pain. 
That means it hasn't quite been processed enough yet. There's not full emotional healing yet. And I think it's important to think about the past and where we have come from. And I think Paul was saying this in this next portion of Scripture that we're going to read here in a second. To simply claim Christ, and and Pentecostals are really good at that, claim Christ, plead the blood, and not deal with it. It's not always the best practice. On the other hand, I don't believe in wallowing in the past for the rest of your life. Living in a perpetual state of of hurt and even condemnation. There's a balance. Isn't it funny how God is just balanced in everything? You know, I have this little theory. I don't know if it's true or not. And and you can tell me what you think about it later. But I have a theory that most doctrine in the church, a lot of like doctrines in the church, I'm not talking about the basic things. I'm talking about the, the ones that really separate us from other denominations and things like that. And the ones that separate them from us. Uh, those kinds of doctrines are usually made in the heat of the moment and, and decided upon and even wordsmithed in those moments where someone has been so extreme on something, they have to jump over here and go way over on this end of it and make a doctrine to say so we don't fall off the edge this way. And then when we fall off the edge this way, they're like, let's make a doctrine over here that keeps us from falling off the edge. It, the church should be balanced. You understand what I'm saying? should be balanced. The pendulum doesn't have to swing all the way that way or all the way that way. The truth of it's in the the center. And I'm not saying saying water down the truth, but I've met a lot of people that were raised in the 60s and early 70s by parents who were so hard-nosed with the gospel, cramming it down their throat, that they don't want anything to do with God anymore. Because there was a real, like, strong, legalistic presence. That's what I'm talking about. Well, you got to be strong. And what is that the result of? That, that's the result of, of, of moral chaos on the other side. You can't have either one, right? It, does it, am I making sense? Balance is so important. And we must acknowledge the pains and hurts of the past, but absolutely process them through the healing and freedom provided by the cross. Because there is freedom. And there is healing, and you don't have to live in that place of pain and suffering. In the first 10 verses of Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul doesn't doesn't say these words exactly, but I I take them as, hey guys, remember where you came from. So let's read it and see if you feel that same way. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And and remember, we're we're taking this in context. We just had eight, but seven weeks of of chapter 1. So here we are in chapter 2. And he says this, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. He's talking to those in the church. He goes, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger. Well, God is love. He can't be angry. Well, that's not what this says. Just like everyone else, it says. I think there's, just to sum that up, it's Paul saying, hey church, remember where you came from. You used to be like the world. You used to be under the, 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 uh, the power of the devil because he worked in you. God's wrath or anger was directed at you because of your sinful living. He's saying all this in there. Remember where you came from. I hope you can hear that. I hope you can hear him saying that. And he's not trying to drum up old sinful stuff in their hearts or hurts they may have experienced uh, in the past so they can feel condemnation or emotional pain again. He's giving them some practical teaching that will keep them in check. In fact, he's giving all of us some practical teaching to keep us in check. Remember where you came from. Number one, it keeps your personal unity with Christ in check when you remember where you came from. To remember that which he has saved you from is to remember how amazing he is. If anything, remembering, in in a healthy way anyway, will, will cause you to fall in love with him all over again. 
I think that's a good, healthy thing to do. And when your love relationship with Christ is right, when you are in him, and the, and the book of Ephesians says, as the book of Ephesians says 36 times, in him, then you are one with him, right? You're one with Christ. You have unity with him when you're in that loving relationship with him. You are unified with him. Your life begins to line up with who he is, his nature, his character, and his word. It lines up with his word. Psalm 103, 2 through 5 says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. May I never forget the good things he does for me or that he's done for me. Remembering where I came from and all God's done. And I love that last part. There are days my youth is renewed like the eagles. There are days when I don't feel so young anymore. Some of you are like, you're a spring chicken compared to me. And and I'll say, I received that in Jesus' name. I'm not that old. But something funny happens when you turn 50. It's just harder to get out of bed. (laughs) Nobody told me there'd be these extra aches. Or that you should go slower during the week. I don't always feel so young anymore, physically and even emotionally. Being tired just comes a whole lot faster. But as we dwell on the good things he has brought us through, all the good things he, in fact, is still doing, our very youth is renewed and even refreshed. I think this is why journaling can be such an amazing thing to do. Journaling about God's faithfulness, his his goodness, his mercy that is constantly lavished on you. Journaling about his never-ending forgiveness. Journaling about everything he has done for you. Remembering where you came from and, and how great and wonderful God is and what he's brought you through. Journaling about all those things. And as you go back and, and read those testimonies of how great he has been in your life, it's amazing how energizing it is. The eagle, where he talks about my youth is renewed like the eagles. The eagle refers to how these birds effortlessly soar, no matter how old they are, by the way. They have learned to depend on the warm updrafts, lifting them to higher and higher places as they spread their wings. And when you watch a bird like that, an eagle or any kind of bird of prey that that just soars on those thermal drafts, they rarely even have to flap their wings. They just soar. And we must learn to do the same. We must remember all that he has brought us through and those just, just remembering that and, and, and thinking about and, and, and going, wow, God, you have brought me a long ways. Though it, it acts like, like that thermal draft. It will just lift your spirit higher and higher until we learn to depend on him as we remember all he's done. See, why is it important to remember where you came from? Because it keeps your personal unity in Christ with check. It draws you close to him continually. I'm not talking about just remembering what he's done in the past. Because I also believe that if you got a testimony over two weeks old, it, it's okay. That's still a testimony. But you should start thinking about getting some more testimonies. Right? God's always working, and we thank him for those things too. But it doesn't take very long for his good work in your life to become something he's done in the past. It takes... A moment. Oh, that was in the past now. Remember what he's done. Life gets difficult, as you already know. Tough things happen, and when those situations occur, we need to remember. Psalm 143, 4 through 6, and this is the psalmist kind of down in the dumps. He says, I am losing all hope. Ever been there? I am paralyzed with fear. Ever been there? I remember, then he goes, I remember the days of old. I ponder all your great works and think about what you have done. And then I lift my hands to you in prayer. See, I thirst for you as a parched land thirsts for rain. And it's, it's, it's interesting when you start remembering all that God has done in your life, even though you might be in the depths of despair, all of a sudden you begin to, you can lift your hands and you can pray and you can talk to him and you can be with him and it renews you. 
When we become dependent upon Jesus, we are simultaneously re- relaxing our own self-sufficiency. I, I want you to get this. Are you self-sufficient or are you Christ-dependent? Which one is remaining in him as a branch plugged into the vine? The true vine of Jesus Christ. Which one is walking in personal unity with Christ? I mean, there's, it's easy. Unity is oneness. The more we remember how much he has brought us through, the more we will stay in unity with him. And that brings me to the second reason why we need to remember where we came from. Paul's reminder, it keeps your unity with one another in check. Remembering where we came from keeps us from becoming elitist in our attitude towards one another. Being an elitist or thinking you are better than someone else is detrimental to any unity that can be accomplished in a church or in the church as a whole. Attitudes of holier than thou, the I'm so much more mature than you, and the I've gone to this church for years so I'm automatically stronger in my relationship with God than than, than you are attitude. Those are all elitist attitudes. Better than. Can I just remind us that even in those elitist attitudes, I, I'm kind of jumping the other direction now, that judging is something that we should do inside the church? We don't like that. Well, you're not supposed to judge. Yeah, you are. We judge one another. I thought that was wrong. No, not inside the church. We're supposed to judge one another. It's biblical within the church and we should all desire to be judged by those who are mature Christians. As in, if I'm doing something out of line, please come talk to me about it, make a judgment call and ask me about it, and let's keep each other accountable. This is going to get not easy, all right? Because nobody likes these kind of verses. Paul said in his letter to the Corinthian church, this is 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it, is, it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. That's judgment in the church, folks. You know what happens in the church today? There's no such thing as church discipline anymore. That used to be a thing. Church discipline. If someone was out of line, there would there'd be a talk, there'd, they'd go to that person, and, and there, that still might happen today in some at least in the first stages, as far as like going to someone saying, hey, there's, some, there's a problem here, let's talk about it. And then the person's like, vroom, out the door. Because they're not going to receive that. You're judging me, I'm out of here. But there was a time when, when church was like, you were committed to a church, and you were like, this was your family, and this was your place, and you had a card in your back pocket that said, First Assembly of God member. No, you didn't have that. <laughs> that was the Baptists who did that or something. But your membership meant something. And so what happened was when there was church correction, you you received it. See, people don't receive that kind of correction anymore. And so what we do is we don't don't do it. We don't do church correction. We we maybe try and then they leave. And if they leave, you know, great, then you, 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 I mean, or, or not great because they didn't change. And maybe, maybe they don't even do that anymore where you confront, because you can't confront anybody, right? If you confront them, they're going to blow up on Facebook on you. <laughs> Folks, we live in that world. Let's just erase all accountability. What's the point of a church if we don't keep each other accountable? And how do you keep each other accountable if there's no judging? You hear me? I mean, I'm not talking about being mean spirit and judgment. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about making a judgment call. And, and going to a brother or sister in love. That can't happen. It doesn't happen very often anymore, hardly anywhere in churches. And if it does, that person's out the door. But they're no better. And I know that judgments can be made that are wrong. I get that. But it's like we've thrown the whole thing out the door. Make no mistake, this, that kind of stuff, that takes those who are within the church 
having the right heart. They have to be unified with Christ in order to work for unity with one another, even in something like a judgment call or keeping somebody accountable. And again, you're not supposed to be nasty in keeping one another accountable. Your motive can't be to rise above them and push them down into condemnation. That's not what I'm talking about. If you remember where you came from yourself, though, it's a lot easier to have mercy and compassion as we engage in judging one another and keeping one another accountable. If I remember where I came from, I can confront somebody in love a lot easier. For instance, I used to have some issues. They were big issues before I found Christ, and they continue to be issues after I found Christ. And I've worked on them and worked on them and worked on them, but an anger issue. Well, why are you so angry? I don't know. I don't know. I had a good life, good upbringing, good parents, all that. I was just mad. I was ornery. Can, you, can, you, can anybody relate to just being born ornery? Maybe it's red hair. I don't know. Maybe it's Irish, German. I don't, I mean, I can blame it on a lot of things. You know what it really was? It was me. It was my issue. It was my sin bent. Just angry. I could just explode in a minute. Short fuse. You know the type, right? And I'm not saying that so you, that you don't talk to me about things you want to talk about. I don't want to go in there. You might blow a rod. You know, I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not doing that. I've overcome that a lot, a lot. I always need to keep it in check, but I've overcome that through the blood of Jesus. But you know, when I deal with somebody who has the same issues and I see them and I go, remember where you came from. Remember who you, remember the struggle you've had. It helps me phrase things right with that individual. It helps me be able to stand in their shoes and understand where they're coming from and why they feel the way they feel. And I, that's just one area. It's just one area. Someone who's, who, who really struggled with unforgiveness, for instance, can help somebody else who's struggling with unforgiveness. Let's say Sandy struggled with unforgiveness her whole life. Right here. She just struggled with it. And then there's somebody sitting right behind her who struggles with unforgiveness. We'll say it's you. Not that it is. Not that you struggle with it. Not, 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 I'm not calling anything out today. If I am, here's the altar. Come and, come and give it to God. <laughs> but she sees that she struggled with unforgiveness. If she goes, if she goes to her and says, hey, I see you're really struggling with unforgiveness. I struggle with that too. And I want to keep you accountable. There's a judgment in there, right? Because you just said you see that she struggles with unforgiveness. That's judgment. It's not mean-spirited judgment, but it's judgment. And say, but here I am to help you. I felt what you felt. See the love and the compassion and the mercy, it all begins to come out when you remember where you came from. And then the church can start functioning like the church. People helping one another. Sharpen each other instead of just, I come, I sit in my chair, I try not to talk to too many people, and I'm out the door. <laughs> Check it off my list for the week. These things are not easy. I'm not saying they are. But church, if we want to rise to the next level, this is where we have to go. This is what we have to do. The tough things. It's a lot easier to have compassion and mercy on people when you remember where you came from. And remember, judge not lest ye be judged. The Bible does say that, which means don't judge others in a way that you don't want to be judged yourself. But if I'm wallowing in something because I can't get over it, and I have a brother in Christ who might, have, who might see that and say, you know, I, I recognize that, I know what you're going through, I want him to judge that and come and talk to me about it. Because I don't want to wallow in it. I want help. You know, maybe that's the problem. It's pride. We don't want any help because we don't need any help. If that's you, you, got, you, you need to spend some time in your face with Jesus because that's a prideful, haughty spirit. It's one of the sins God hates. He hates all sin, but that's one of the ones that says he hates. Pride. We need each other. There's no doubt about that. It's also, it's not helpful to stick your head in the sand when it comes to those within the church who would morally corrupt those that 
or maybe more immature in, your, in their faith walk, looking the other way is not the answer. I kind of covered that already, but, but just that's what a lot of churches do. They just look the other way. Like, we're not going to deal with that. We don't want our numbers to go down. If I make that family mad by calling them out, even privately, then they'll all leave, and then we'll, our numbers will go down, and that'll be a bad thing. You see how ugly it can get so quick? This is why unity with Christ, your personal unity with Christ, is so important. It's the basis for your unity with each other. And Paul's beginning to lay the groundwork and shifting the conversation in Ephesians from unity in Christ personally to how that flows into unity with one another. And he says it beautifully. To lovingly encourage an individual within the body of Christ that some change needs to occur is absolutely imperative. But don't ever engage in it without first remembering where you came from. That puts everything into perspective and you'll be able to make judgment calls based on love and mercy that Jesus has shown you and not on some misguided position of elitism and authority that one might think they've earned for being here so long or being a Christian so long. And by the way, this also takes having healthy relationships with others in the church. I, I think about that. Is there healthy relationships in this church? Yes, there are. There's many of them. But we could always do better, right? Love and mercy flows between people that are close, people that are unified. The more loving relationships you have, you may find out that the more accountability you create, well, then I don't want to be in relationship with a lot of people in church. It might produce too much accountability, and I don't want to hear it. Maybe that's the reason we're not close sometimes, or that we just kind of push people away. Is this, is this hitting anything here this morning? It's hard, church. I'm not, I'm not saying this is an easy thing to live out. We need to remember where we came from so that we remain humble, while at the same time refusing to let the devil start lying to us about how unworthy of Jesus' love we are, right? So that, that's what happens. We, as soon as we remember the past and remember where we came from, then the devil jumps in there and is like, you're worthless. See what you did? And then we're like, why, why did I even remember my past? That's like an unhealthy thing. No, remembering the past is a healthy thing. But when the devil starts to lie to you about it, that's when you put him in his place. Okay? You don't, you don't stop remembering. You don't just say, well, I'm not going to remember that anymore. So hard. Christian arrogance and elitism has probably kept also, kind of shifting here a little bit, away from relationships in the church, relationships outside the church, but Christian arrogance and elitism has probably kept more people away from a relationship with Christ than just about anything. People who are outside the body of Christ, as they go through pain, hurt, and struggle, they, they start searching for some kind of relief, some kind of healing. And how many times has it happened upon those same people meeting a representative of Christ, you know, the, the ones who, those, those Bible-quoting, Bible-toting believers, right? Well-meaning, I'm sure. How many times do they end up meeting somebody like that, and then they feel worse because of the judgment and the shame and even the hypocrisy they get from that person. Yeah. Wait a minute, Pastor Barry, you just said we're supposed to judge. Yeah, inside the church, but not outside. There's a big difference. Well, how do, you, how do you know if they're inside or outside the church? You make a judgment call. That's a hard one. See why I need to be prayed up? All this is difficult. But when you approach people in the church with this, like, lovingly, I'm going to keep you accountable, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to and then you, you go outside the church, and, and I've seen this. I've seen people get saved here at this very altar, and they're not even out the outside door yet. They're in the foyer, and someone grabs them and says, if that was a real decision, you'll change this in your life immediately. Now, yes, they're in the church, but give them some love and some time and some space. How long did it take you to get where you are? I won't tell you what I said to that person when, they, uh, when I saw that happen, but I was not happy. It's 
That's a believer who has forgotten where they came from. And all they can see now is their perceived, superior, perceived superiority over the brand new believer. Remembering where you came from keeps you in check. With our fellow believers in Christ, we can function and operate in our relationships with a greater sense of love and humility, remembering all that Jesus has done for us. And those outside the church, we can have even more compassion for because we remember what it was like when we didn't know Christ, right? Remembering absolutely does that. I want to read to you Romans 12, 3. Because of the privilege and the authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Paul is talking about the faith that has been built up within us because of all that we have gone through. We go through stuff and it builds our faith. I, I, I want to read, and, and I know we're early today, but that's okay. I want to read verses 4 through 10 in Ephesians 2. We just went over 1 through 3, um, but I want to read seven more verses to you. And I want you to hear them. I'm going to read them slow, okay, very slow. Because this is the continuation of Paul's reminder. He says, but God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Here's that unity message again. It's all through here. So God can point to us in all future ages, as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. Notice he didn't say he can point at, us, point at us as examples of how wonderful we are. He didn't say that. He said he can point at us as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness that's been displayed towards us, that we've, that's been lavished on us, that we have received from him as a free gift as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. And you can't take credit for this. And you can't take credit for this. It sounds like a song, doesn't it? We should write a song about that. You can't take credit for it. You can't take credit for what God has done in your life. He's done it. All you can do is praise him. You didn't earn it. You weren't good enough for it. He didn't somehow do something so wonderful and he went, oh, I'm going to do this for you because you're so great. He just did it because he loves you. It's unearned, undeserved. God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Verse 9, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. The only thing we're going to boast about one day in heaven is Jesus. Amen. Not about our stuff. Right. Any crowns we receive, we throw them at his feet anyway. Right. He has created, or I'm not, verse 9. So none of us can boast about it. Verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the, thing, the good things he planned for us long ago. So even the good we do is because he created us and purposed in his heart from the beginning that we would do those things, and we can only do those things when we're in him. When, were we, when we remain in him. And we could spend a month just on these seven verses, but I want you to read them this week. This is your assignment. I want you to read those verses this week, meditate on them, ask God to shine his light of truth on them for you. Because it's humbling to realize you're just, you, you just don't have it going on as much as you might think you have it going on. Some of you might remember the story. I won't tell the story, but I'll just tell you the punchline. You might think you're a humdinger, but you're just a dinger. Right? You're not all that in a bag of chips. And yet you're his masterpiece Amen. at the same time. 
You're fearfully and wonderfully made and you're amazing. But it's all because of Him. It's all because of Him. And if you do take time to meditate on this, and I, I, I promise that pride in your life will diminish any spiritual elitism that you may have over others, it's going to crumble. You may even begin to prefer your brothers and sisters who are in Christ over yourself, putting their needs above your own. Because you realize life only comes from Him. I'm dead and He lives inside of me. Less of, more, less of me, more of you, God. These are difficult things, guys. I, I know it. But our high calling from Christ isn't supposed to be a walk in the park. It's difficult. And as the world seems to get darker and more crazy, it becomes even more difficult. But that gives us all the more reason to walk in unity with Jesus and to walk in unity with one another. Is there anybody that's perfect in here? then why do we expect each other to be perfect in everything? Well, I don't like that guy because he's not perfect. Neither are you. Paul's saying, remember where you came from. It puts, the perspective, it puts everything in right perspective so you can stay unified with Christ and so you can stay unified with one another. Don't go to an unhealthy place where you wallow in it, in that remembering your past. Realize Jesus set you free, Right? But remember, deal with it. Think about all the great things that he has done for you through all that. It's tremendous. Let's pray this morning, and I want to pray. For us as a congregation, I want to pray. God, we see these things in your word, and they're not easy. How do we walk that balancing act, that, that, that tightrope of, of balance and between calling out those things that might not be right and making sure our heart's right and living together in unity and harmony and, Lord, not being puffed up with pride and all these things we've talked about. How do we do that without your help? And the answer is we can't. We need you, God. We want to be the answer to your prayer, Jesus. The only unanswered prayer that you ever prayed. It will be answered, but we want to be the answer to that. And that is that your church would be one, even as the Father and the Son are one. Lord, we want to be one. We want to walk in unity. We want to walk in victory. We don't want to walk in sameness, but we want to walk in agreement. We want to be a picture of you to this whole area. A picture of you. We want to be a reflection of who you are. Father God, I pray you'd kill pride in our hearts. You'd change us from the inside out. You'd help us to love people that we wouldn't normally even want to be around. You'd help us appreciate things that we never appreciated before about one another. Lord, that you'd begin to help us develop into a church that truly, like the Ephesians, and why Paul thanked you for them over and over, that they loved you and they, they loved each other. We want to be like that. We want to love you and love each other. Lord, I think we have such a great foundation for that already in this place. Father, we pray for more of that. We pray for more. If simply for no other reason, then we don't have to deal with those issues and we can keep our focus and our energies pointed in winning this lost world to you without any distractions of inner turmoil. God, we give you our hearts again today give you our lives, and we say we're yours. In Jesus' name, amen.